Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Bold Explorer Live. This is another in our afternoon reading sessions, and I'm reading H.V. Morton's In Search of England. Uh, and if you've stumbled across this for the very first time and thought this in looks interesting, we've been doing this uh, throughout the lockdown period, reading books, um, old books, uh, and um, doing about 45 minutes or so of reading in the afternoons at four o'clock. If you're watching live, of course, you probably will know that already. Uh, welcome to people who are watching and contributing uh, to Steve G to Turbo Stream. Good afternoon to you guys and the other 14 odd people who have decided to tune in, which is very kind of you. So, yes, this is In Search of England by H.V. Uh, Morton. And this was published in the 1940s. Uh, this version of it, I think, was 1940. Well, no, 48, 46. The first issued in 1927. This edition is uh, 1946. That's right. So this book was written in the 20s. That's correct. But before the Second World War. I just have to uh, remind myself of those things. So we're reading the book. And actually, we're very close to the end now. I've got a couple of... Uh, chapters to go and that's more or less it so we'll see how far we get thank you very much for joining uh, you're very welcome to contribute uh, in the comments of course I'm, I'm saying all this because very often we get new people now as the subscriptions I'm thrilled to say we're over 13,000 subscribers to the channel which is brilliant so people um, may not always know what the lives are about. So this particular afternoon live is the reading live. Sometimes I do other lives and I do a, a sister show called The Vogue Show, which I should be doing this evening at 8 o'clock. Completely different thing on a different channel. Anyway, we will crack on. Hello to James Poulton uh, from Tinseltown. Good afternoon to you. Linda Kane, who's here. Uh, Damo, good evening. Hello from nearby Tunbridge Wells. Lots of walking round here. Penshurst, Hever Castle, etc. Yes, I must get my uh, self over there and do some exploring. John Morris, hello to you. Uh, definitely lots of um, stuff to come. And uh, as the country is slowly opening itself up, um, I'm going away next week, as it happens, to uh, from Saturday for a week in Wiltshire. Uh, so the walks and the lives, hopefully, will be coming from there. So that would be interesting. Not sure how it's going to go. It's all a bit pie in the sky, but we'll do our best. Hello to Malcolm Craig from Croydon. Hello to you. Um, very kind of you to uh, drop by. So, yeah, just to reiterate, in case somebody comes and thinks this is a discussion show, uh, that we're just reading Where We Left Off in Search of England by H.V. Morton. And you're very welcome to comment if there's things that, uh, or, you know, chat amongst yourselves or whatever. If there's things that um, inspire you from this. But this is very much part of my quest for England, where I'm reading a series of books, a lot of them from the 20s and 40s, pre-Second World War, really. I think that's where my, my England lies, pre-1940s and before. Jeff Kellison. Uh, uh, 13,000, I can remember less than 4,000. No one is more thrilled than me. Ah, how lovely. Thank you, Jeff. Well, you've been a, an amazing contributor, I must say. Uh, thank you very much for your very, very um, enthusiasm and financial assistance as well, which has made it all possible. And just so you know, uh, this is just to Jeff, really. Uh, I still haven't got round to putting it in. It's here, and it does need to go. I just haven't had time. I just haven't had time. I haven't even opened the box, which is terrible, but uh, this is going to help our live shows and stuff. But uh, I've got a full diary at the moment, um, and I've been editing the Hay Meadow stuff. The Allotment Channel is here. Good afternoon. It's Bakewell Tart today. Sounds great. I didn't know you could grow Bakewell Tarts, but hey-ho. And Andrew Norris, what ho everyone. Marvellous. Right, let's uh, crack on with our reading. We're on, uh, I forget what chapter we're on now. Uh, let's have a quick gander here. Because the time suddenly ticks away. And apologies for sometimes my bad reading. Chapter 11, this is chapter 11, part 5, as it happens. 
in the book doesn't always that unboxing vid oh yes an unboxing vid and yeah i could do a, not only an unboxing vid but a, a putting the graphics card into the computer vid uh, and censor all the swearing and the oops oh no i've just broken it do um stuff that you tend to get christian soldier hello all hello to you so let's uh, we'll carry on reading with this. Um, I will try and do another discussion, Board Explorer discussion show, probably when I'm away in Wiltshire. It'll be um, in the afternoon, I imagine. When did I do it last time? Was it Saturday afternoon? Um, it may not be Saturday afternoon, maybe Saturday evening. Anyway, the silence of death lies over the peddler's way. A man can walk for many a mile in solitude on this ghost of a mighty road. From Thetford, it runs six miles to Hockham. Then, straight as an arrow, it lies for thirty miles, sometimes hidden beneath the fields, through Castle Acre. Now, is that Castle Acre? Castle Acre and Great Bircham to the coast of Branchester. Oh, yes, he's in, I think he's in Norfolk, isn't he? Did we leave him in Norfolk? I can't quite remember where we left him now. It's trouble when the weekend goes and I get out and, and busy. Long before men knew the name of England, they knew the Peddler's Way. Uh, that would be an interesting walk to do, wouldn't it, Peddler's Way? How old it is, no man can say. When the Romans came, it was antiquity, trodden hard by countless generations, and the Romans were glad because it was straight and to the point, and saved them the trouble. In the Middle Ages, the Peddler's Way served a new England and led to one of the saint saintiest points of the land, to Our Lady of Walsingham. Now, the Peddler's Way is dead. Is the Peddler's Way... Can somebody look this up? Is the Peddler's Way still in existence as a, as a long-distance footpath? I don't know it. The little cotton tail plays upon it. The weasel and the blackbird bird own it. For the feet of the men who made the peddler's way went into silence many centuries ago along the road of eternity. It would be sad if it's now um, a busy road in which traffic is on. I'm writing this beside the old road. Where I sit, I can see the ghost of it under the grass, broad and embanked, slipping into the distance over the fields. Here it is drenched in green gloom. The thick trees which hedge it arch themselves above it, and in the hush of this still afternoon I fancy that the leaves have just stopped whispering together of the things that once went by along the peddler's way. Must be the A11 road these days. Yeah, I wonder if it is. I am conscious of this ghostly spot. Every time a leaf falls, every time there is a sudden rustle in the undergrowth, I look up, half expecting to see a figure not of this age coming towards me along the dead road. Once I look quickly behind me, there was nothing but an unnatural stillness. Even the birds seemed hushed along the peddler's way. They say that black shuck haunts this road as he haunts the coast near Cromer. Oh, yeah, definitely in uh, North Norfolk. He is a jet black hound, big as a calf. Between ourselves, he is the hound of Thor. He still haunts Norfolk on nights as black as himself. Still a national trail, says Malcolm Craig. Thank you. It's listed as a footpath. Oh, brilliant. Still exists, apparently. Thank you, Ben Reeve. Um, oh, that's great. Well, I need to go back to Norfolk. There's so many, you know, this is what I love about England. There are just so many places, so many fascinating places, and I can't wait to get hot-footing it around and exploring these places. It's, um, it's just, you know, it's just so awesome, really. An empty house can be ghostly, but the ghostlier far, but ghostlier far is an empty road with no that no men use. The beauty and the magic of a road are something this age doesn't know. Our roads are too good and too many, and we even notice uh, and sorry, and we never notice them except when they are bad or in the hands of the road mender. But there was a time, and the peddler's way belongs to it, 
when a road, like fire and a roof, was one, one of the primitive blessings of life. And more than that, a sign that men could combine in a common task and follow the same track to a journey's end. Uh, Linda Kane tells us that Peddler Way starts in Suffolk at Nettershaw Heath County Park and follows the route of a Roman road for 49 miles to Holm next to the sea on the North Norfolk coast. Now, it's interesting because Morton says it was older than the Romans. So that's interesting. 50 miles. That would be easy to, to walk. You could probably do that in three days, couldn't you? But filming-wise, you'd probably spend a week or more. But that would be fun to do. Um, the Peddler's Way was planned long before history began. See, that's what he says. Uh, it has seen men use the flint mace head. It has seen the stone weapon give way to metal. It has nursed the dawning civilization, century after century, leading such traffic and such commerce as there was away from the wilderness. First a savage trail, then a road. The lovely Julia has arrived. Hello, lovely Julia. Sorry I'm late. No, it's all right, lovely Julia. I don't think we've had any problems. Um, Turbo says, I'm hoping to do a vid from my local section of the Monarch's Way soon. I'll get my finger out. Yeah, I, I, the Monarch's Way, I have um, I would love to do. And I did put, I've got this um, thing called Trello, I think it's called, which is a research um, website. Not website, it's... Um, it's a website where people can contribute. It's like a notice board, but to, to, to trip things. Haven't overly used it in the last month or so. It's uh, just been busy doing other things. And it's um, it's really, it, it's a resource that people can put stuff who want to help. And Linda Kane has done such. And one of the concepts is to, to walk um, the length of the Monarch's Way, uh, which I think is something like 635 miles, and make a series of programmes. I'm not too bothered about physically walking every last step. It isn't a personal goal. It's to tell the story and find interesting places on the way. So it might actually mean driving through away from the boring bits and all of that. It's not. I don't want to make a video like some of these long long distance people who who, who to them it's a personal challenge. I'm not worried about that because I go walking all the time. I'm not actually worried about it being a personal thing. Um, but I want to explore the route and the highlights of the route because making videos is about, usually, should be, in my theory, taking the boring bits and removing them. So, uh, Nigel Sadler, hello. Live from Dover Calais Ferry, just a couple of miles off the French coast. Have a lovely holiday and thank you for your uh, lovely gift. I still don't know what it is. But that's from Nigel Sadler. Thank you very much as he goes to France. Never to be seen again. Shame. Jeff says, I'd love to go to Cromer. Lots of American journalists stayed at the seafront hotels at the beginning of the Second World War. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a, I don't know it terribly well, but I know where Cromer carpets are because I did a video uh, which featured them a long, long time ago. Anyway, let's get back to the reading. Uh, the legions came, perhaps straightened out a corner here and there, and it led them from Camelodun Camelodunum, which we call Colchester, to Branadunum on the Wash, which we call Brancaster. I know I'm not reading these um, um, Roman names terribly well. Branod, Branadunum, Branadunum. Branodod, Branodonum, is it? Branodonum and Camulodonum, Camulodonum, probably, something like that. So far, the peddler's way knew war and commerce. Centuries were to pass and it was to know religion. In that remarkable collection of old houses called Walsingham, north of Fakenham, stands the scanty ruin of the mighty abbey from which the time of Henry III to the dissolution drew king, queen and commoner to the shine, the shrine of the virgin. 
At first, the shrine was a modest wooden chapel. But when Nazareth fell into the hands of the infidel, the monks of Walsingham, by one of those perhaps not accidental strokes of fancy, for the fortunes of Glastonbury were once firmly financed by another such inspiration, said that the mother of God, driven out from Palestine, had taken up her abode in Norfolk. They said subsequently that their shrines of Our Lady of Walsingham was actually the Sancta Casa from Nazareth. Then the peddler's way became the pilgrim's way. It heard the tapping of the pilgrim's staff. It saw men and women from every part of Europe making their way to Walsingham. It saw pilgrim cavalcades, like the which Chaucer took so gloriously to Canterbury. It saw the poor man hobbling by the roadside. It saw the king, in all his majesty, riding a tall charger, surrounded by his court. Henry III, Edward I, Edward II, Bruce of Scotland, Henry VII, and, before the religious revolution, Henry VIII, all took the pilgrim's way to Walsingham. When they reached Little Houghton in the Dale, they removed their shoes. There is still a house named Shoe House and continued the rest of the way barefoot. Unless you've seen a pilgrimage, it's difficult to imagine this scene. I've watched the pilgrims start from Mecca and I've seen Syrian Christians on their knees in Bethlehem and in Jerusalem, tears rolling down their faces as they kissed the end of sticks which the priests pushed through marble pillars to touch some sacred relic. In the famous shrine stood the statue of the Virgin the, and Erasmus, who visited in 1511, and said of it, There is little or no light in it, but what proceeds from wax tapers yielding a most pleasant and odoriferous smell? But if you look up, you will say that it is the seat of the gods, so bright and shining as it is all over with jewels, gold and silver. Strange relics were kept in the shrine, including a flask of the virgin's milk and a joint of one of St Peter's fingers. That sounds a little bit gruesome, doesn't it? There came a day when the last pilgrim abased himself before the shrine, and soon the peddler's way saw men come, riding, and in the midst of, um, and in the midst of them Our Lady of Walsingham, plucked from her candlelight, going on her way to be burned at Smithfield. Then the peddler's way knew that some strange thing had happened to England, and the grass began to grow. The sunlight slants down through the leaves on the old broad track. In moonlight it must look wonderful. Some day I will come back and walk the peddler's way by moonlight, and it will not surprise me then to be spoken in the stillness, perhaps in the tongue no man knows, perhaps in Latin, perhaps in Norman French, perhaps in Tudor English. For all these tongues have wagged along the peddler's way, but they have said only the road what they have said only the road knows and is dead or in a sleep like death with the grass above it and only the song of birds to remind it that the world goes on. Morton Lewis, howdy doody, sorry I'm late, I've been doing a language exchange with a gorgeous Uran Ukrainian, oh lucky old you, uh, where are we, what county, Norfolk on the Peddler's Way, that's where we are, Morton, I think you should eat a bit less red meat, says Audrey, he's a red-blooded Englishman living in Spain with Ukrainian beauties all around him, sounds perfect, let me get on the bus, uh, Ollie S. Hi, Richard. Hello, Ollie S. Les Jarvis, good afternoon. Julia, I'm also late. Graham Cass, YouTube channel, Walk With Me, Tim, Guide Tour of Chroma, Jeff. Hmm. Right, we're on uh, part 16 now. For the last 10 days, I've been miserable. 
I've been prostate in bed with a red-hot throat and a foul temper which turned into a fine pathos and the dismal belief that I was about to commit the supreme sin against good manners and die in a hotel. Maybe he's got an early strand of Covid. You may do almost anything in a hotel but die there. One night, under the influence of a cocaine pill, a cocaine pill, and a raw egg, a cocaine pill and a raw egg, there we are, there's a remedy for you, I sat up and wrote the most miserable essay that has ever been written about the country graveyards of England, the fine old yew trees and the lichen-headed stones. The doctor read it and took away my pen. And so, quite helpless, I sank into a fever. My only pleasure, the poor one, of watching my hand open and close the light from the window, wondering why it was my hand and who on earth I was. <coughs> Excuse me, I think he's passed it on to me, the swine. It's written into the book. Perhaps if you will have a million of... Oh, my goodness. Streptococci in the throat, you will understand. Anybody know what streptococci is? However, the evil dream is over. The germs are slain. The boots, who's, who has neuro, neurogaia, has the... Co uh, ha the boots, who has the neurogaia, whatever that is, neural, neural gaia, has the cocaine pills, the chamber... The chambermaid has the gargle, and I, at last, have the open road and the occasional glimpse of the sun. Poor bugger. Now, in England, there are many magic islands, the only islands which refute to geography primers, because they are entirely surrounded by dry land. Centuries ago, these islands, which today are merely hills rising from green fields, were surrounded by marshy waters that have at various dates been drained away in the interests of agriculture. These isles are the Isle of Avalon in Somerset, to which, says legend, the hooded queens took the dying King Arthur, the Isle of Athelney also in Somerset, where King Alfred gathered his forces before he smashed the Danes, and the Isle of Ely in Cambridgeshire, from whose fastness Harewood and Harewood the Wake defied the Conqueror. There is the Thorny Isle, on which Westminster Abbey stands, and the Isle of Thanet, and I am sure several others. I travelled towards Ely in the early morning, long before the first harvester was awake. I don't think he's talking about pubs at that point. At this time of year, a veil of white mist lies over the Cambridgeshire fenlands, a pearl-pale thing, thin and chill, and as I went on through it, I felt as though I was sailing on a ghostly sh sea. The, dim, the dimly seen hedges of this flat chessboard land were like the edges of poised beakers. Suddenly I saw before me, like a frozen ship upon a frozen ocean, the Isle of Ely rising in spectral beauty above the morning mist. This sudden high hill, crowned with its towered cathedral, seen above the white mist of late summer, is one of the most beautiful things in the whole of England. It is a spellbound hill, the creation, it seems, of a wizard's wand a floating camelot spun by the fairies from the mushroom mists and ready to dissolve into the cold air even as a man looks in wonder at it. What an amazing turn of phrase this author has. He, he, I know he was prolific with his writing, but his turn of phrase and his use of language is, is just sublime. It's really, really good. Uh, streptoco strepto streptococci or whatever are bacteria. Thank you for that. Bacteria family. Thank you, Ben and Linda, for that. Cocaine was legal from the chemists until 1926. Good gracious! So you could get a a cocaine pill. How amazing! 
As the sun rises and the mists melt, the Isle of Ely, the Isle of Eels is the real name, grows to reality, becomes a little town on a hill clustered round its old cathedral. But even in full sunlight, it is never quite, it never quite loses its air of having been built by magic. There is nothing in Ely but the cathedral, and the cathedral is a lady. H. D. Howells said that Wells Cathedral in Somerset is the feminine cathedral of England, and guidebooks have copied this remark to such an extent that most people believe it to be true. I cannot. Wells Cathedral is, to my mind, distinctly masculine. It is strong, decorated, ornate... Sorry, in its strong, decorated, ornate way, it seems to me almost as masculine as Durham. Ely Cathedral is, to my eye, the only feminine cathedral in England. In fanciful mood, one might think of Ely as the wife of Durham. Durham is the grim Norman knight, Ely the lovely Norman lady. Ely is delicate, tinted, full of gracious beauty. Her unique octagonal tower helps the argument. No other cathedral wears so remarkable a hat. Ely Cathedral, I must remind you, was founded by a woman. It was to this windy island that the saintly Ethel Raider, in the Age of Saints, took refuge 1,353 years ago. After 12 years of unhappy married life as Queen of Northumbria, she fled to her native fens and founded a church, living there in, a great, in great humility and godliness. Memory of her is preserved, how many people know, in the word tawdy. Her popular name was Saint Audrey, and the famous pilgrims fair at at Ely, no, known as, sorry, I'll read that again, memory of her is preserved, how many people know, in the word tawdy. Her popular name was St Audrey, and the famous pilgrims' fair at Ely, known as St Audrey's Fair, gathered together a number of cheap jacks and huskers who sold neckcloths of sink, s silk, named St Audrey's Chains, or vulgary, tawdry's. Another word, by the way, supposed to have come from Ely, is billycock. Centuries later, the, months, the monks of Ely wore, by special licence from the Pope, head coverings named willocks to protect them from the winds that whipped their little island in the winter. I must mention the monk Alan of Walsingham, who built the octagonal tower, and many other parts of this lovely church. He was one of the greatest architects of the Middle Ages. On February the 22nd, 1322, just as the monks were retiring to their cells, the old Norman tower of Ely fell down into the choir. With such a shock, says the old chronicler, that it was thought an earthquake had taken place. Alan of Walsingham rose up by night and came and stood over the heap of ruins, not knowing whither to turn, but recovering his courage and confident in the help of God and his kind of Mother Mary and in the mid merits of the Holy Virgin Ethel Raider, he set his hand to work. How magnificently he did can be seen today. I suppose no one but an architect can truly appreciate the genius of this monk. Ely to me, as to most people, means Harewood the Wake. I must say that it means Harewood the Wake to me more than it does to most people because about 25 years ago I was Harewood the Wake on, a, on Saturday afternoons and with luck Sundays while another boy with wild red hair was William the Conqueror, a role that never appealed to me. A fine upstanding manure heap in the paddock was our Isle of Ely, and I can see in great detail to this day the bony, freckled, furious William the Conqueror, who is now a missionary in West Africa, charging me with a clothes prop. Ely is the, in general, Ely is in general 
confirmation, exactly like our old Ely of the paddock, and as I stood on the high spot and looked down over the green sea of the fens, I knew from personal experience that Haywood, is it Harewood, or Harewood, was never seriously worried about the Norman cavalry, which blundered unhappily about in the marshes. But what a great story it is, that of the conqueror, who when Harewood had been portrayed by the monks on the condition that their possessions should be spared, came secretly to Ely when the monks, when the monks were at dinner. He knew that they expected a gift from him as a reward for, the, for their treachery to Harewood. The conqueror stood in silence and alone before the high altar. He flung down on it a single gold mark, worth about £150 in modern money, and walked quietly out to his horse. In a few moments, the monks were surprised by a knight who rushed into them, crying, You wretched drivellers! Can you choose no better time for guzzling than this when the king is here in your very church? The brethren made a rush for the church, but it was empty. They ran out after the king and caught him three miles off at Witchford. They apologised. He accepted the apology and fined them 700 silver marks, about £14,000. They melted down the church ornaments to pay the fine, but the Norman officials reported that the ingots were deficient in weight, which made William fine the monks a further 300 marks, so that this silence reverie before the high, high altar cost Ely £20,000. I turned from the fens and looked back at the hill of good St Audrey, which through centuries had ridden the rough sea of English history as it rides above the biting winds of Cambridgeshire. And about it, in these September mornings, is the phantom calm of a ship that has left old storms behind it. What about that? That's amazing, isn't it? So I, I love the way he weaves the stories and then returns to the present day. He does it so very well. Uh, Morton says, My grandmother in Brum loved a drop of laudanum, oh yes, and a coke pill, swore by it. She rubbed opiates on my teeth. On my, oh, sorry, on my teething mother's gums. Bless her. Uh, there we go. Uh, Morton says Sir uh, H.V. is a corking author, isn't he? I wish I wish there were... I, I mean, I, I, apparently he was prolific, but I, I need to get hold of some more books from him. The Ship of the Fens, says Linda Kane, with a beautiful lantern tower. I've been there. We did make a video. Not a brilliant video. It's not one of my best. It was a bit... I knew nothing about Ely, nothing about it, and we went there, and it was a disastrous film. Really? Oh, excuse me. But... But... If you've never seen Ely, it does show a bit of it off. They wouldn't let us film down into the great choir and look up at this octagonal lantern choir. Well, they probably would if we'd paid. Larry Hazelwood has arrived. Hello, Larry. Linda Kane says, when I visited the cathedral, there was a pet service going on. Oh, very amusing. Uh, yeah, there we go. And Graham Cass says, what a corrupt lot, those Normans. Pronounce Harrywood. Is it? Harry Wood. Harry Ward. Harry Ward. Not Harry Ward. Harry Ward. I stopped at the White Hart in Brandon to drink beer. Sensible man. Brandon is in Suffolk, but Brandon Railway Station is in Norfolk. Now, while I sit here taking short stock of the argumentative little groups around the bar there, tricked in from the outside, a curious incessant tapping, a queer tinkly metal sound for which I could find no name. It was not the sound of a shoeing forge, it was too thin. Oh, that, replied a labourer, that is young Mr Edwards napping gun flints in the shed at the back. Whereupon, I put down my tankard and went out to find young Mr Edwards.
I suppose thousands of travellers pass through this apparently uninteresting little town every week without the slightest suspicion that it contains the oldest commercial firm on earth. It is that of Fred Snare, who states that his business was established in the 10th century. Before history began, men chipped flints at Brandon. They made those beautiful and efficient little arrowheads which we f find buried in the earth. They made flint knives and flint scrapers. They mined Grimes' graves nearby for flint. They dug long galleries in the chalk and took out the flint which with picks made of red deer antlers. The lost art of chipping flint has been kept active in this Suffolk village for tens of thousands of years. Nowhere else is the difference is the difficult art of knocking this stubborn stone into shape practised as in Brandon. And one wonders whether that still happens a hundred years later today, I wonder. The door of the shed was open. A young man was sitting on a low stool with a stout leather guard strapped above the knee of his left leg. On his guard he held a great nodule of flint which he hit sharply with a short-necked hammer, making in the process a pe making the peculiar glassy hard tinkle that I'd heard. On one side of him lay a great mound of newly minted flint, with the chalk still clinging to it, and on the other was a tin tub half full of little square smoky blue gun flints, the finished article. He smiled an invitation, so I went in and sat on the upturned tub watching him. Have you ever tried to make an arrowhead of flint? I have, and I've never succeeded. It, was all, it, it has always been a mystery how our Stone Age ancestors worked the brittle stone, how they made it into small razor-edged arrowheads and long thin spearheads all neatly chipped as if the steel hard stone had been nibbled into shape by a mouse. As I watched young Mr Edwards nap his flints I realised that flint behaves well if you know exactly where to hit it. Mr Edwards took up a lump of the stone, hit it gently and seemed to listen to the sound. When satisfied by the sound he hit harder, and the flint broke crisply along the lines of cleavage. He now had a fine. He now had a nice piece. He had, he now had a nice flat piece of flint to work on. He struck it near the edges. It flaked, and he proceeded to fashion a little square gun flint with a series of quick, expert blows. And the astonishing thing to me was that the disobedient stone obeyed him. In a few seconds another gun flint fell into the tin tub and another flake was on his knee. You have to learn this trick when you're young, said Mr Edward, and some can't even learn it then. It's a kind of gift. Handed down from the Stone Age, I asked. Well, he smiled, so I've been told. What happens to all these gun flints? There's a great trade for them in Africa and places where the natives use the old flintlock. All the gun flints used today come from Brandon. They sell them in bags of 50. I gathered that the flint napping trade, like so many ancient trades, may die out within this generation. That's my phone ringing. I don't know why that's ringing. It's probably somebody trying to uh, ask me if I've had an accident but I'm going to let it ring off. Which it will. Um, my other phone didn't ring, so there we go. That's just the house phone. Don't let it worry you. You probably didn't hear it. And the, no one's left a message. Good. They sell in bags of 50. Yes, OK. I uh, like it. Oh, yes. I gather this, uh, this may die out in, within this generation. Young boys do not take to the kindly to the art. It is too poorly paid and too difficult and the flint dust is supposed to eat into the lungs. The flint nappers of Brandon have dwindled to about half a dozen and most of them regard the job as a spare time one. 
I watched Mr Edwards make, uh, without one flaw, gunflint after gunflint. He worked with astonishing speed, and the glassy hard tinkle of his little metal hammer on the flint was one of the most fascinating sounds I've heard. A second sound, I thought, to which the human race won its battle for mastery over the beasts thousands of years ago. Make me an arrowhead, I asked. That's something I can't do. Oh, make me an arrowhead, he said. Oh, that's one thing I can't do, said Mr Edwards. There's only one man here who can, and he probably wouldn't. He lives down the street. He can make arrowheads and mace heads, but he won't tell how he does it. Well, get Sir Arthur. So, sorry, we get Sir Arthur this and Sir John that down here to tell him how he chips his flint implements, but he won't say. For instance, he made this last week. He handed me an axe head of stone. I know very little about prehistoric antiquities and I would unhesitatingly have bought this as genuine. I found this old arrow head maker in his cottage and I asked him how he learnt the lost art. When I was a boy, he said, I used to hear the professors and such like who came up to the flint working say that they could not think how these old Stone Age men made their weapons. So I started to practice and the idea came to me. It came to me suddenly. I thought to myself, this is how these people work flint and stone. And I began to make arrowheads and act heads. And some of them, I'm afraid, got into museums. Mr Spaulding looked stubborn. It's my secret, he said. I thought it out myself and I don't see why I should give it away. He opened a drawer in which lay a little collection of Neolithic arrowheads, beautifully chipped. In the second drawer lay an identical collection. Mr Spaulding pointed to the second drawer and said simply, I made those in my spare time. No man looking at these two collections, separated by who knows how many thousands of years, could doubt that ancient and modern had been made by the same method, whatever that may be. The strange thing is that while Mr Spaulding can manufacture Stone Age weapons that puzzle antiquity, he cannot fashion gunflint. He is not really one of Brandon's flint nappers. He is, even to the men who daily master this brittle stone, a mystery. They know the difference he has overcome in the higher branches of flint working, an art which, till he remembered it, had been lost these thousand years. I left him standing at his cottage door holding a stone axe to which he had fixed a stout handle bound to the stone with rough strands of untanned oxhide. He swung the axe and said how perfect the balance was and it occurred to me that he looked rather like a caveman standing there in the darkness of his cottage door, ready to defy any inquisitive professor, ready to defend his discovery with flint-like tenacity. And I thought that I had seen one of those people who cannot disguise a belief in reincarnation. He would... And I thought that I had be... Sorry, and I thought, it's always the last sentence, so I always, I don't know, there must be a psychological thing. And I thought that I had been one of those people who cannot disguise a belief in reincarnation. He would not have got off quite so easy. Oh, and I thought, oh, and I thought that had I have been one of those people who cannot disguise a belief in reincarnation, he would not have got off so easily. Neither perhaps considering the perfect balance of the prehistoric acts. Might I? And we're now on chapter 12. I'm going to leave it there because I think uh, I was just getting to the end of my potential reading problem. It's a very old profession. You only have to ask Fred Flintstone, says Michael Angel. That's very true. The town, um, says Linda Kane, have an annual arts festival. Morris dancing is an important of it. Many sites come from all over the country in Europe. Great atmosphere. Sounds, sounds lovely. It's probably Richard Suggett. Yeah, probably. Um, he doesn't tend to ring my home phone, though, uh, which is good. It's 
probably have you had an accident, I dare say. Years ago, says Linda, I was on a short archaeology course. One of the members was a flint napper. Absolutely fascinating to watch. So skillful. How about that? Well, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to leave it there for today. Thank you so much for coming along and joining me on our In Search of uh, England reading of by H.V. Morton. Um, we are... I'll just try and work out how much more we've got. This is chapter 12. Yeah, probably a, Probably by the end of the week, we should get to the end of the book, which would be perfect. Uh, it'd be silly to start a book because I'm going to be away, although I'm hoping to... I must remind, remind myself to take a book with me to read uh, if I do get to the end because... Um, I'm hoping to carry on these readings and things, but they may be a bit delayed because I'm obviously going to be out in the daytime trying to film, although if we have good weather, I'll be out early to avoid people. So there we go. Um, hope you enjoyed it, and I will be back at uh, 8 o'clock this evening on the Vogue Show channel, which is called the Vogue Show, for those that don't know. Uh, different show, light-hearted, nonsense show this being our reading afternoon and I'll be back again tomorrow hopefully I'm out in Lis in the morning early but I hope to be back by three o'clock at the latest so that I'm here for three uh, for four to do the next um, reading show and then I shall edit up the following day's video anyway hope you enjoyed today's video which was uh, looking at the uh, meadow the part two of the meadow harvest is tomorrow that's all ready to go part three will be on wednesday it's a three-parter and in part three we'll see where the hay meadow goes anyway there you go thanks very much look after yourselves um and i'll catch up with you anon bye bye for now bye bye thanks for watching bye bye